Um, next, I want to bring Joe Tucci on stage, who is one of the world's great business leaders, one of the most effective business leaders. Um, and uh, once he gets up here, I'll, I'll give you a, a piece of, of data which I find really impressive that underscores just how uh, effective he's been during the time he's been at EMC. Sit down, Joe. Thank you for being here. Great to be here. Um, in 2002, EMC had revenues of about $5 billion. This year, it's estimated to have revenues of, of $22 billion. Uh, acquisitions have been critical during that time. However, the revenue of all the companies at the time of acquisition did not total more than $2.5 billion. So he has added a tremendous amount of value at that company. Uh, and also shifted it from what was once a really exclusive focus on you know, high-end storage platforms to a much more uh, broad-ranging company that has a lot of software operations uh, and a lot, many of you heard some interesting stuff uh, from the Greenplum subsidiary yesterday afternoon. So I guess you know, we've talked so much about data here and you have put yourself in EMC in an extraordinary position at a time when data is universally acknowledged to be one of the most central things happening, which, you know, last week's presidential, this, was it this week, last week, whatever, last week's last presidential week. election underscored tremendously. So I guess the first question I'd ask you, Joe, is how much is this data analytics thing going to change the world from the standpoint of, from your view, as, as leading one of the main companies that's been enabling it? And, is there any industry that will be exempt from the transformation? Well, first I'd start, David, where it's not, you, know, you use the word will, and I, I, I use the word is changing the world. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, you just talked, heard about cancer, the, the decoding of the human genome. That's, that was a big data problem, and that happened several years ago. So, uh, I, but to answer your question specifically, I absolutely believe, firmly believe, that every single industry will be totally revolutionized and by uh, big data. Okay, now, do most of those industries realize that yet? <laughs> I'd say a fair amount do. I mean, you spend a lot of time with the biggest CEOs. Do they get it? I think they do. You do? I, do. I don't think they do, but okay. We'll discuss that another time. Um, We're going to bash CEOs again. Here well, it goes. I love bashing CEOs. <laughs> I love bashing, uh, no, I don't love, I don't love bashing CEOs at all, but I continue to believe that most CEOs do not appreciate the pace at which this Data analytics, among other things, the mobile revolution, cloud computing, is transforming their businesses. I think they're not alert enough to some of those realities. Look, if you're, most CEOs think in terms of, what, you know, what are my key lasting assets, right? And, you know, first, and, you know, first you have a brand, right? Brand is incredibly valuable and it lasts beyond any CEO terms, in many cases, for well over 100 years. So second, you, yeah. second you have your people. Now, people is not, a, is not an accounting asset, but people who, any CEO knows their people's their greatest asset. The way you get those people to work together is you have a whole set of processes that support your business. And those processes are kind of enabled by applications. So I would say your processes and your application is a lasting asset, and then your information is, is, a, is a lasting asset. So any good CEO knows that they got to make sure they protect all four of those assets and utilize them to the benefit of their business. Well, I'm glad you're confident of that. Um, so I want to go back. I mean, I think you're right. We'll obviously. agree to disagree. We, we, I mean, I think it's impossible to generalize about CEOs to some extent, I suppose, anyway. But talking about you, who is inarguably a great CEO, you know, when you were approaching, for example, the decision about whether to buy VMware, which is you know, one of the most important things you did, and then you later spun a lot of it out. But um, what was in your mind? I mean, that was such a fundamental shift for your company. Uh, how did you go about that? I mean, and, and is there any lesson, again, for CEOs in general or leaders that, that you've sort of taken away from having made some pretty big gambles that have paid off for EMC, with, especially with acquisitions? Well, like you said, one of the things uh, when, I, when, I, when I started as CEO uh, back in 2002, my first year, full year, um, you know, we were basically a leader in high-end storage, period. And that is not a good base to, uh, not, it's not a, that's not a, a, you know, strong enough foundation for a company. Because if you can attack that, that one thing that we did well, you could really hurt the company. So you want to, you know, broaden your base 
and it's, then it's hard to knock. So basically we went from high-end storage to mid-tier storage to low-end storage. Then basically if you're storing information, you, you want to protect that information, make sure it's always available. Uh, you want to make sure that information is secure, that brought us into security. And then of course you want to get intelligence from that information and, and that brought us into predictive analytics. And then of course what we realized is there's going to be a whole new way of processing and in the data centers, and that's what, that's what led us to virtualization. You know, people ask me, did I see everything about the cloud and IT as a service when we went VMware? And he absolutely is, absolutely not. I did not see that at all. I only saw two things, <laughs> and two things that we saw we got right. Uh, number one was, you know, servers at that time were about 7% utilized on whole, and they were single core. And we knew that multi-core was coming, and this was going to get worse, and this would be a great market virtualizing servers and give us another great leg to stand on. The second thing we recognize is that EMC only did network storage. Therefore, there was a tremendous amount of storage that was stuck, isolated in servers. And of course, VMware collected that, and, and basically by taking a, a one server, making it look like, say, 10 servers, you take the storage out of the boxes, and then it's storage that we could get at. So we're increasing our TAM for storage. And those are the two things we saw, and they were both definitely right. And then, of course, it's the story's gotten a lot better. Well, as you've broadened what EMC does, um, who, who do you think of as your main competitors at this point? You know, it, it depends where you are in the business. If you looked at our security business, it would be different than if you looked at our high-end storage business, than our mid-tier storage business, than our analytics business. So it's, it depends where we are, but we have no shortage of competitors. Are there any of your uh, any any other players in the industry you'd call out as having be doing a particularly great job right now, repositioning themselves, or any that might be doing a particularly poor job? <laughs> well, I'm not going to I'm not going to you know go on a poor side, but you know obviously you know what Amazon does is rather remarkable. Um, we have a very different strategy, and they're not a customer either, right? No, they're not. Uh, we have a very different strategy, but I think Oracle's burned their platform. IBM has done a good job. So there's a number, we're, you know, we, I, I think we've done a good job, but we're not alone. Well, you mentioned Oracle. Uh, how big of a deal is cloud computing? It's Oracle's working hard to reposition itself uh, in, in relationship to. I mean, is that as big as the data revolution in your view? And is it also going to effectively al you know, alter every- Well, they're, they're, they're inextricably linked, right? I mean, uh, to get the kind of pervasive intelligence out of data in real time, it predictively, we want it, we, we, need, we, need, we need a pervasive way to, we need a new way and a pervasive way of, of computing that data, data center architecture. And that's where cloud comes in. So they're inextricably linked. Uh, you know, we have a very different strategy than Oracle. You know, we're building our infrastructure horizontally. We're, we're very close on standardization on x86. We do a lot of virtualization of compute, storage, network, security, you know, things like firewalls, load balancers. And then, of course, there's a vast amount of automation replacing management tools. And then you run all the apps on that same substrate, where Oracle's building more of a stack. So we got a very different strategy, but obviously they've done a good job, too. I like our, I like our position, don't get me wrong. Your position seems pretty darn good to me, I got to say. Um, but you know, just with data being so important, how can you not be, you've got so many elements of storing, protecting, thinking about, understanding data. That, that is, has been, I think, quite brilliant. Um, but, you know, I want to talk, I want to get to some questions from the audience, but um, you, you, well, one thing I wanted to ask you, you were about to leave as CEO, uh, and you made a decision to stay. Tell me what, what was behind that. Well, the, biggest, the biggest thing behind that was uh, the leaders in the company, uh, and who I have tremendous confidence in for the future, asked me if I would stay a little bit longer. What a nice position to be in. Yeah, I, I, wouldn't, I say this to the board in all the respect. You know, the board had to want me to do that also, had, had, and they asked. But I would not have done it only for the board. What I really did it for is the people of EMC who really wanted me to stay around a couple more years. And, and I'm having fun, and I think it's great to see this change. So uh, it's, it's just an honor. Well, it's true, a lot, a lot of the best CEOs have left just when things were about to turn downhill, so it's probably a good sign that you're staying a few <laughs> years. Think of all those, that's always an interesting one. Uh, so, let's talk about the economy for a second, because I know it's something that, you know, at, at your scale, you have no choice but to think about. Where do you see the U.S. economy right now, and the global economy? It, you know, it's, it's widely viewed as pretty precarious, and, and just give us your big picture view of, of what's happening right now. 
I'm really optimistic with one big caveat. Uh, I have never seen, we're a global company, we operate in 87 countries around the world. I've never seen a time where the rest of the world was looking for U.S. for leadership. So I think it's all... Any more than now. You think right now that's... Right now is the, is the peak. Yeah. They, they want the U.S. to be successful. They want leadership. And I truly believe if we address what's commonly called not a fiscal cliff problems adequately, uh, the, the rest, the, we'll have a decent 2013 globally. Really? What are the chances that that will happen? <laughs> well, I think it's, it's impinging upon everyone listening and everybody in the room, uh, every CEO, to make sure that we put the pressure on Congress to say, we need a grand compromise. This is not, this is not a Democratic or Republican solution. We need to raise revenues. To that, the Democrats are right. And we need to balance the budget over time. We need to, we need to rein in spending. So how we do that you know, is, is going to be a compromise. If it can't be an all Democratic or all Republican. They've got to come together someplace in the middle, left of center, right of center, I care not. Uh, but come together and care about the people of the United States, which is very important for the people of the world. And if we do that properly, I think 2013 will be better than people suspect. If we blow that, so to speak, to use a little prose, I think 2013 globally will be bad. How bad? Right, we'll be in a recession. And if, you're in a, you know, and if you get a double dip, you know, the second dip is likely to be worse. And so for Europe, for example, you think if the U.S. can deal with our budgetary problems, that would possibly help them continue to stumble along? I, I think Europe has harder problems than we do in the U.S., right? Uh, but they're doing their best. And I think if the U.S. is solid, right, and the other super, super player, China, is solid, I think Europe will, will, will you know, obviously I don't think it's going to be robust, but it'll be okay. And, but it needs uh, A to two, you know, super economy players, U.S. and China, to, to cooperate, not fight. And then it needs the U.S. to fix its uh, fiscal problems. How involved are you right now in talking to our government leaders to try to... Well, it's one of the advantages of staying because, you know, I put in three great, you know, kind of five-star generals. You know, David Goulden is running EM the EMC core business. Pat Gelsinger is running VMware. And Paul Moritz is doing some new and innovative things around a developer's platform and big data. So that frees me up a little more time uh, to spend on issues like this. So you are spending some I am spending personal time, personal commitment, uh, and encouraging others, all of you. Uh, this is our country. We've got to make sure that you know, it's we the people, by the people, for the people. We've got to make sure that we live those words every day. And that's a this week challenge, right? I mean, this I, is happening in real time right this now. This is happening in real time. Yeah. I, and, and what's your gut feeling of what's going to happen? I'm, I'm optimistic. I mean, I hope uh, you know, it would be, be a pretty vengeful act not to come together. But the art of it is communications and it's compromise and creating a win-win. No one party can have everything they want. But I think uh, this grand compromise is, is incredibly needed in this global economy and, of course, the U.S. No, I'm really glad to hear you talking about it like that. You mentioned China. Uh, you have a big business in China. You're on the board of advisors for the Xinhua Business School. You spend Correct. a lot of time there yourself. How do you see the Chinese economy, and how do you see U.S.-Chinese relations evolving with new, with new leadership there and Obama's re-election? Well, you know, China, the new leadership team in China, I have not met all of it, but some of, it, some of them, uh, is very bright, very experienced, very well-educated, and I think they understand this has got to be a win-win, uh, win-win uh, between them and the U.S., and they, I, think that, I believe they f understand, as I said before, uh, that the world needs, a, a, you know, Europe, Europe and the rest of the world needs uh, China and the U.S. to get along and do a bit of their own win-win grand compromise. And the key to any, any relationship, right, is communications, o frequent communications, open communications, putting yourself in the other person's shoe and trying to think through. And, and this happened to every one of us in any kind of personal relationship we've ever had. It's never your way. I mean, because if you don't compromise a little bit, both parties, yeah, man, I don't think it's a healthy relationship. And, and uh, that's what has to happen. But I do think the Chinese leaders realize that. And if we approach it in, a, in the right way, we'll be fine. And, and as I said, I go back to what I said, the world needs us to get along. I sometimes wonder if they realize that more than we do, though. China? Yeah. Uh, you know, you've got to separate a little bit of election rhetoric from reality. Uh, I have more confidence in that in our political leaders in Washington. I think they understand 
the importance of China on the global stage, and, and we'll see, right? Well, yeah. I'm, yes, okay. Uh, but in the Chinese economy is slowing, but that doesn't frighten no, you. You know, I mean, the air's, the air's, it's slow two points. Some people think maybe it's a little more than that, but still it's growing. In that, I think the lowest I've ever seen is almost 6% growth, so it's not a disaster. They have, a, they have uh, you know, they have a surplus, not a deficit. They have tremendous people flowing into the middle class. So there's a lot China can do to, to create, to continue to prosper and create growth. And I'm sure they'll do that, especially with a leadership transition coming up at the end of the year. Does anybody have a comment or question, question for Joe? Here's a question right here. Uh, can we get a mic over here? Now, if it's about constructions and It's not about construction, <laughs> thanks, David. Um, uh, Sam Stath is from Theometrics. You mentioned Morning. China and the US and uh, the world looking for leadership. Uh, what are your feelings about how Brazil is moving on with their infrastructure and their model to uh, expand and ec economic growth? Well, I think Brazil's done a great job, probably a remarkable job over the last uh, 10 years. Uh, but of course, Brazil slowed down too. So uh, the world is dependent on it. I mean, we're in a global, we're, it's a, this is a global economy and it's never going back. And you know, isolationist theories will not work any place. They won't work here, they won't work in Brazil, they won't work in China. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm very, very, very high on Brazil, and we're, we're, we're continuing to make investments in Brazil, and uh, I like what I see a lot. Any other questions back in the back there? Identify yourself, please. Hi there, Rob Tarkov, CEO of Lithium Technologies. Now, Rob, you've got to be easy on I'll him. I'll go easy on him. Former executive. <laughs> no, don't go got, easy on him. Got acquired by uh, EMC about 10 years ago. I stayed there for four years. I can say Joe knows how to build teams. Uh, Joe, I got two questions for you. One is we had a panel yesterday and the folks talked about the four horsemen, Google, uh, Amazon, Facebook, and... Apple. So, Apple, thank you. And uh, I'm curious to know from your perspective, who's the most underestimated company in this mix that nobody is thinking about? And when I think about where EMC is, that's obviously one option. My second question for you is, when is VMware, if ever, gonna get spun out entirely? Well, yes, I'll start at the end, uh, never. Um, <laughs> The, um, the, I think, Rob, um, I think the best way to answer that is I, I really think that when, you th when everybody talks about cloud computing, they underestimate how big private cloud computing is going to be. And there's going to be players that are going to emerge and really pop that. But again, it's not going to be an all private world, but there's, uh, you can get a critical, you can get criti crit criticality of mass pretty simple now, pretty easy now. Uh, and the key is to standardize, right? Today in our world, uh, in the traditional IT world, the application owns the infrastructure, and you gotta buy it, and you get the, all these silos, maybe one for your collaboration work, one for your, uh, for your ERP, one for your CRM, one for your billing, et cetera, et cetera. And you have to buy all of these stacks for peak of the, peak of the day, peak of the year, and you're over-provisioning everything for that little bit of time you need it. Where cloud computing basically cuts this way, Right? And, and companies that move from different architectures and standardize. So the first thing any cloud is, public cloud has done is they standardize. And in my, in my experience, they've all standardized on x86 architectures, not five different architectures. They don't set up different infrastructures for their applications. They run their applications all on the same infrastructure. So if we take those moves inside companies, they can get 90 plus percent of the benefits of cloud computing and the security and a lot of other things uh, control that, that they get from private cloud. Now, of course, I don't believe private clouds will s support, I think you're gonna see these hybrid, where companies, when they do get bursts, are gonna want to work. Uh, they're gonna, there are activities which, which work very well in public clouds, and that'll continue. So I think it's a world of both. And I think you'll see some stars born from that, from that era, right? Or that ilk of technology you know, companies. Since a part of Rob's question was sort of corporate strategy and decision making, you know, you've got a very tight relationship with Cisco in recent years. We do. There's been some speculation, you know, recently that maybe it was shaky. Is it, how, how is that relationship going right now? Well, point blank, that? Cisco is our closest and the most strategic partner. And I believe we're gonna have a long uh, and, and prosperous uh, relationship. Um, obviously, uh, as we basically follow our cloud view to build the public cloud, 
when an application works on a horizontal infrastructure, the application will speak to that, uh, that, to that infrastructure. We call it the software-defined data center. It'll say, these are the service levels I need you to attain for me, right? meet for me. These are the policies that must be adhered to. These are some cost metrics that I got to be accountable to. So basically, it'll take those three things, your service levels, your policies, your cost constraints, and it'll combine them in, the, in a magic automa automation soup and, and, then, and then assign then dynamically the amount of cores you need to run the application, the type of storage you need to run the application, the type, and basically some of the networking functions. Now down here, moving the actual data is, is, is a world where we're not going into. We're not gonna buy a hardware networking company or get into that layer. There's a lot of software in the hardware layer too. And that's where we're gonna partner with Cisco. So basically, we think the, the, the future of the software-defined cloud data center needs to deal with not only compute, but storage, networking, security, and then a whole ancillary set of services like load balancers, firewalls, et cetera. So you anticipate working even closer and long term with them as that continues to evolve. There's in a the tremendous amount yeah. of, of you, you look at all, I mean, there's five, five, uh, 5,000 petabytes a day putting in, being put into the digital universe. 5,000, that's, and people, and the only reason you put there is people want to access it. I mean, so you need, the communications requirements of tomorrow are going to be dramatic. So Cisco has a great opportunity to continue to grow and expand, and it's very complementary to what we want to do. So obviously, you know, getting into the network space with the acquisition of Acer and VMware, you know, I, I'd be less than honest if I said didn't put a little stress on the relationship. But again, uh, communications, win-win, uh, the things you do in, in real life to make a, a relationship work, we're applying here, and if we do that, we'll come out even stronger. And when you go through those periods, uh, you know, if you have good intent, and John's a 22-year personal friend uh, underpinning this whole relationship, I, John Chambers, uh, I think will be, I believe, truly believe will be just fine. He used to report to you at Wang, right? <laughs> a little bit, yeah. <laughs> uh, any, any last question? Okay, uh, here, identify yourself. Morning, uh, Mickey McManus from Maya. How are you? How you doing? Um, so what, I think I just read that we, we do, we, we're making more than 10 billion microprocessors a year and, and on track in five years to have trillions of information devices. Sort of the rise of big sensor and, and the internet of things. How will that affect EMC or how, what opportunities are there in that space? Oh, it's amazing. I mean, I think right now if you look smart devices, it's a number. It's people here that know better than I do, but it's something around two and a half billion I've read. And they're talking about uh, by the end of this decade being 70 billion. Two and a half billion to 70 billion. And, I, and almost everything that, and again, if, if you look at Rick's book, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of good hints of where this world is today and where it's going. Uh, but you know, you're gonna see sensors being built into almost everything. Uh, certainly every electronic device, every uh, electromechanical device or mechanical device, and then even things that you wear. I mean, there's, you know, March sneakers today, they have shirts and, and uh, sh pants for high, high, uh, high performance athletes that, so that they're running, they, under, they get all this data collected about them so make them improve better. So it's, it's gonna be an amazing world, but if you think of two and a half million sensors going to 70, two and a half billion going to 70 billion, it's tremendous opportunity because uh, that information needs to be stored, it needs to be protected, it needs to, you want to get, you want to get, uh, it needs to be secured, and you need to get value and, and make predictive decisions from that information. So that's where we're headed. And then of course you want to do that in a cloud environment, public and private, and that's our strategy. We have one more, time for one more quick question. Uh, my name is Matt Van Horn from PATH, and uh, you guys acquired Pivotal Labs yes, early, earlier this year, and they've, pioneered pair programming and a lot of the agile process. And I'm curious how that's worked it into your company's overall process or if you're using Pivotal Tracker for your product development process or how that acquisition has changed the culture of your company at all, if it has yet. Uh, I, I think Pivotal, I don't want to give a lot away because we're going to talk about this in a, in a couple of months when we talk about the next phase of our strategy, but I could tell you that uh, Pivotal was a fantastic acquisition. Uh, it hasn't you know, Pivotal's been working with this, this new world of the web developers. So again, being more, any company that's gone to any degree of success has gotten a huge cadre of developers 
around their infrastructures and what they're doing. So this helps there. And we're, we'll be announcing some plans shortly, and you'll see that it is incredibly, and we do use it internally as, as well as externally, and it's, uh, when I, I would say it's phenomenally uh, successful and will be more so. So pivotal will be pivotal. Um, pivotal will be pivotal. That's good. Joe, I love the way you think. <laughs> I love the way your bluntness. I love your big picture view. And I really love that EMC and Techonomy are, are pretty closely allied. So thanks so much. Well, for thanks, David. Here. And great, great. Thanks for inviting me. Really appreciate Thank you. you. Have a good conference.